I love writing. In fact, writing is my gateway drug into the world of linguistics. So while it's no longer my main focus, it still holds a very special place in my heart. So I figured, what better topic to talk about than the one that got me so invested into linguistics in the first place? To start our dive into the different writing systems of the world, let's talk about one that everyone watching this video is probably familiar with. The alphabet. When the alphabet is mentioned, many people's minds probably go to one in particular, the Latin alphabet. But when I say the alphabet, I'm referring to all the alphabets of the world, and their defining way of encoding speech into text. This specific feature of all alphabets, including Latin, is that consonants and vowels have equal status in writing. What I mean there is that vowels and consonants have separate characters or glyphs. So the vowel sound a ah, is represented with this glyph, while the consonant sound b is represented with this glyph. Now this doesn't mean one-to-one -one sound correspondence between glyphs and sounds. After all, the sound f has multiple spellings. This glyph has two sounds in it, y and u. There's a whole mess with o-u-g-h in English. And there's finally y, which acts like both a consonant and a vowel. But none of those particularly matter, as the defining feature of an alphabet isn't that all vowels and consonants must have their own character, but that vowels and consonants are treated equal in writing. This will become much clearer when looking at the other types of writing systems in this list. Next on our list are the objads. Similarly to the alphabet, objads also make a distinction between consonants and vowels. But instead of giving both consonants and vowels their own glyphs, they just don't write vowels. Mostly. See, the early objads didn't write vowels at all. These are known as pure objads. However, most modern-day objads are what are known as impure objads, meaning they have optional vowel glyphs, a limited number of situational vowel glyphs that serve double duty as a consonant and a vowel, or both. In Arabic, for example, all short vowels aren't written, though they do have optional diacritical marks, shown here in green. And most long vowels and diphthongs are indicated through similar-sounding consonantal letters, shown here in red. Abjad's alphabets and abugidas, which we'll get to later, are all what are known as segmental scripts, as they represent individual segments or phones in writing. The first of these segmental scripts that we know about is the Proto-Sinaitic script, which eventually turned into various scripts like Arabic, Hebrew, Ge'ez, most of the scripts found in India and Southeast Asia, as well as the Phoenician Abjad, which in turn became Greek, Latin, Cyrillic, and most of the world's alphabets today. Now before we talk about the final type of segmental script, the Abugida, we need to talk about a non-segmental script, the syllabary. The syllabary, as a writing system, doesn't encode individual segments like alphabets and objads. Instead, they encode entire syllables into glyphs. The consequence of this is that most syllabaries have much larger glyph inventories than most segmental scripts. Take Japanese, Cherokee, or even the E alphabet. Even though syllabaries encode syllables, they generally don't encode all the available syllables of a language. Most of the time, they'll encode the smaller syllables, like CV, VC, or CVC, and then use various strategies of combining said glyphs to produce more complex syllables. So why did I turn away from the final segmental script to talk about syllabaries? Because another name for abugidas are alpha syllabaries, or alphabetic syllabaries. There's this common misconception that abugidas like Devanagari and Thai have consonant letters with vowel diacritics around said consonants. But this is not correct, for you see, each character in an abugida is a syllable in and of itself, much like the syllabary we just discussed. Each character is a consonant plus an inherent vowel. Most of the time, this inherent vowel is the same across all characters. Diacritics or other glyphs that change that vowel are then added around that base character. So here, we have the Sanskrit character ka. It represents the sounds k and a. Now notice how when we add various marks, it changes the vowel of the syllable. In some North American languages, particularly in Canada, and a few Chinese ones, this is taken a step further with no inherent vowel on the character. Instead, the syllable's consonant is determined by the shape, but the vowel the character makes is based on its direction. The final type of phonetic writing system we're going to talk about is the featural writing system. 
Now, unlike syllabaries, alphabets, objads, and abugidas, a featural writing system isn't its own type of system. To better illustrate this, let's take a look at the best known featural system there is, the Korean alphabet. The Korean alphabet, created under the order of King Sejong, is said to encode the position of the tongue and mouth into the shape of its consonantal letters. A vertical line at the back to signify velars, a vertical line in the front to signify alveolars, a triangle shape for the S, horizontal line across the top for stops and affricates, and another horizontal line for aspirates. Each character shows how it's pronounced. The vowels also follow this trend by using the concept of yin and yang. See, Korean, Old Korean especially, has vowel harmony, which means that the vowels of affixes and inflections all agree with that of the root stem. Only one vowel didn't need to agree, however, this being E. So, light vowels were classified as yang, pointing up or to the right, and represent the sun of the heavens while dark vowels were classified as yin and pointed down or to the left, as well as representing the ground. The neutral e represented humanity between, since it could coexist in both positions. Because of this, the Korean alphabet is considered featural, as it shows a logical connection between how the letter is pronounced and how it's written, but in the end it's still an alphabet, with a fully realized vowel consonant distinction. Now, Korean is an extreme example, but many other scripts have semi featural components as well. In Japanese, the voice syllables are made by adding a dakuten to the voiceless counterparts. Or in Latin scripts, with diacritics, like the tilde, which tells you a vowel is nasalized in Portuguese, or the umlaut, which tells you a vowel is fronted. Now, something to keep in mind is that these categories of writing systems aren't hard and set distinctions but more guidelines for how to categorize a script. After all, different scripts might mix and match components of each writing system. Japanese, for instance, has a final segmental ng character, or the impure abjads, which largely don't show vowels, but sometimes do, like an alphabet. Now that I've described all the different phonetic types of writing systems, I suppose it's about time I talk about the only non-phonetic type of writing system, the logography. Now, although they are last on this list, logographies are actually the first type of writing system that came into existence, with the oldest being either Sumerian or Egyptian, depending on who you ask. However, despite being the first writing system, the only living logography is Chinese logography, though Mayan script may be making a comeback. The basic principle behind the logography is that each word or morpheme is represented by a single character. These can be pictographs, like in Chinese for person, tree, or eye, simple ideographs, like in Chinese for up and down, or compound ideographs, which combine two other characters to represent an idea, like rest is a person under a tree, or to look is an eye on legs. However, this alone cannot fully represent language, so most logographies include some phonetic element to the mix. In logosyllabic systems, like Chinese and Sumerian, Characters were used to represent their syllabic or neosyllabic value. The main way of doing this was to just take the character and use it only for its sound value, in a principle known as rebus. So take Sumerian arrow as an example. It's pronounced T and could also be used to write the phonetically identical rib, or phonetically similar teal, meaning life. A similar thing happened in Chinese with the character for nose being used for self or scorpion for 10,000, though in Chinese the original meaning of these characters has since faded away. However, by doing this, one can often overload a single character with many different meanings. So an unpronounced determiner could be added to clarify the meaning of the character, or another character was used to narrow its phonetic scope. Like the Sumerian character for arrow, if wood is put before it, it always has its original meaning of arrow, but if flesh was put before it, it would mean ribs. For the sense of life, a character with the pronunciation of ill could be added to the end. In Chinese, these phonetic plus determiners could be combined into one new character, known as a phonosemantic compound. This is still how Chinese characters work today. Chinese and Sumerian are both representative of logosyllabic type logographies but they're not the only type of logography. There's also the logo-consonantal type, 
which we can find in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Originally, Egyptian hieroglyphs also followed a similar path to that of Sumerian and Chinese, but split off from that route when it began to use rebus characters. See, unlike Sumerian or Chinese, where words would act as roots that affix is attached to, Egyptian, as an Afroasiatic language, didn't function like this. Instead, Egyptian roots were groups of two to three consonantal letters that would slide into certain templates in order to show various meanings. To better illustrate this, let's take a look at the adjective nafir. In the feminine, this would become nafrat. The internal vowels of the word changed, but the consonants themselves didn't. Because of this, when using rebus, Egyptians would focus on the consonants of the words and ignore the vowels. The daughter system of Egyptian hieroglyphics was the Proto-Sinaitic script, the very first abjad, which eventually spread to become most of the world's abjads, alphabets, and abugidas. If you wish to find out more about the history of writing, or the different types of writing systems I described in this video, do check out The Writing Revolution, Cuneiform to the Internet, by Amalia E. Nana Desikan. Amalia, if you ever watch this, I am so very sorry for butchering your last name.